Well, welcome back. Good to see you all. Have you been enjoying our study together? Yes. Parables are important, aren't they? Yes. They're uh, just as important as Daniel and Revelation. In fact, they dovetail with Daniel and Revelation in many details. Now, in this class, we are going to study lesson number four, The Rich Man and Lazarus. And uh, the page is 27 in your syllabus. And we're going to see that this parable has a definite end time dimension, just like the previous one that we studied. I've tried to choose the parables that uh, directly address issues that have to do with the end time, the investigative judgment, the separation of the righteous from the wicked, the eternal reward, etc. Uh, before we begin this lesson, we do want to have a word of prayer, so let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we study this um, very interesting parable or allegory that Jesus told uh, we ask that you will give us understanding. Help us not to place our own ideas in this story. Help us to withdraw from Scripture the, the ideas that you placed in this story. We realize that many misinterpret it, but we ask that you will give us an open mind and heart to teach this lesson as you wanted us to understand it. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're on page 27 of our syllabus, lesson number four, The Rich Man and Lazarus. And uh, we'll follow along just like we've done with all of the previous lessons. How does the story of the rich man and Lazarus begin? It begins by saying there was a certain rich man. Now, why is this important? Uh, very clearly, the beginning of this uh, story begins just like the rest of the parables of Jesus. So it indicates that this is a parable. Uh, you have several references here in the note. Uh, Luke 10, 33, Luke 12, 16, Luke 13, 6, 14, uh, 16, 15, 11, 16, 1, 19, 12, Luke 20, verse 9. In other words, all of these begin parables with the same formula. So we know that this is, uh, this is a parable. It's a story that teaches uh, spiritual truth. Uh, number two, what was the proper name of the beggar? And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Lazarus. So we have a proper name in this, uh, in this parable. Now let's read the note because it's important. Some scholars have concluded that the story of the rich man and Lazarus is not a parable, but rather a true-to-life story. They reason that because the parables in the Bible as well as in rabbinical tradition, uh, you never find proper names. This is the only, if this is a parable, it's the only parable that has a proper name. And so therefore they say that this must mean that this story was an actual historical occurrence. But as we shall find later in our study, there was a particular reason why Jesus included a proper name in this particular parable. So Jesus included a proper name in the parable for a very specific purpose, which we're going to see a little bit later on. Number three, to whom was the parable of the rich man and Lazarus particularly addressed? This is very important, folks. We need to notice to whom Jesus is addressing his parables, because it helps us understand why he spoke in the way that he did. Uh, the answer to this question uh, is very simple. We are told in Luke 16, verse 14, And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things, and they derided him. So this parable was addressed specifically to the Pharisees. This is vitally important. You say, why is it so important? Well, let's continue. Number four. In what way were the beliefs of the Pharisees different from those of the Sadducees? See, the Pharisees and Sadducees were two Jewish sects. They didn't like each other very much because they had different theologies. The Sadducees were the liberals and the Pharisees were the conservatives in the Jewish church of that day. What was the difference? Notice the Apostle Paul described in Acts 23 verse 8, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angels nor spirits. 
but the Pharisees confess both. So the Sadducees believed that when a person died, that was it. They did not believe in the immortality of the soul. The Sadducees did not. The Pharisees, we're going to find, did believe in the immortality of the soul. That's an important point. Because Jesus is addressing individuals who believe that the soul of man is immortal, the Pharisees. If he'd spoken to the Sadducees, uh, he wouldn't have spoken uh, this parable, because they did not believe in the immortality of the soul. Let's go to the next page, page 28. The Jewish historian Flavius Josephus amplifies this contrast between the beliefs of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We read a Bible verse in Acts 23, but now let's go and read something that was written by Flavius Josephus. By the way, Josephus was born in the year 37 AD, which was only six years after the death of Christ. So he's uh, a contemporary, basic, basically, of the events that fa happened to Christ. Uh, Wars of the Jews, 2, uh, period 14, uh, book 2, uh, paragraph 14, says the following. The Pharisees say that all souls are incorruptible, but that the souls of good men only are removed into other bodies, but that the souls of bad men are subject to eternal punishment. But the Sadducees take away the belief of the immortal duration of the soul and the punishments and rewards in Hades. So it's important to realize at this point that the Pharisees believe that the soul of man is immortal. That's the reason why Jesus told this story within their frame of reference. Now let's read also the additional note which adds details that help us understand why Jesus used this parable. Josephus, who was himself a Pharisee, described the nature of Hades in his work Discourse to the Greeks Concerning Hades. And I'm, I have a summary here of what Josephus wrote in that book. There he described Hades as a subterraneous region consisting of two sections. The first section contained everlasting fire. The angels took the wicked to this region upon the moment of death. The second section of Hades consisted of a place which was called the bosom of Abraham. Josephus affirms that there was a great gulf fixed between the two sections, so, far, so that the righteous could not pass to the fiery region, nor the wicked to the bosom of Abraham. There is no place in the Bible which even vaguely suggests such a scenario. And yet evangelicals these days, they will use this. Have you ever had an individual say, well, you know, before Jesus died on the cross, you know, the righteous souls were taken to the bosom of Abraham, and uh, the, the souls of the wicked, they went to, to burn in the fires of hell or of Hades. Yes, absolutely. There's no place in the Bible which even vaguely suggests such a scenario. This whole picture of Hades was created by the rabbis. In the parable, however, Jesus took what the Pharisees believed and gave it a surprising twist. Because the Pharisees would have said that, that the Jews upon death would go to the bosom of Abraham because they were children of Abraham. Whereas those Gentiles that were despised, they would go to the fire. But Jesus says just the opposite. He turns the parable upside down that they already knew and they already had. Now let's ask the question, can the parable be taken literally? Well, let's look at several points here. Jesus in John 5 verse 28 told us where people go when they die. And I read, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Where do people go when they die? According to Jesus, to the grave, not to Hades. By the way, Jesus doesn't say here, the, the time is coming in which all the bodies that are in the graves. He says, all that are in the graves, the people who died, are in the grave. Number two, 
according to the Bible, when will the wicked be burned in the fires of hell? Is it at the moment of death that the wicked uh, suffer the fires of hell? No. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, we are told, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be when? In the end of the age. The Bible clearly tells us when the wicked are going to be destroyed in the fire. Let's read the note. At this point, it would be well to study the following scriptures, which unequivocally teach that the wicked will be cast into the fire when Jesus comes, not at the moment of death. And you have several references here, Matthew 25, 31, and 32, which we're going to find technically takes place after the millennium, but it's after the millennium that the wicked are thrown into the fire. Mark 9, 43 to 48, where Jesus says, Do not fear, he was able to kill the body, but not kill the soul. In other words, body means this present existence, the soul means eternal life. Don't fear him who is only able to take away your present physical life, but the one who is able to take away your eternal life. That's, the, that's what Jesus is teaching when you carefully study it. Um, John 12, 48 says that the wicked will receive their reward when Jesus comes. Revelation 27 through 9 says the wicked will be thrown into the fire after the millennium. Likewise, Revelation 20, 11 to 15 tells us the same. 2 Peter 3, verse 7 and verses 12 to 14 tell us that it's at the very end that the wicked are thrown in the fire, as does 1 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. So very clearly, all of these passages, which I didn't include in the lesson because it would make it too long, but there they are for you to read, tell us that the wicked are thrown into the fire, not at death, they are thrown into the fire, technically, after the millennium, after they see the judgment scene above the city. Number three, what does the story explicitly state about the rich man? Let's just read the story. It says, the rich man also died, and his body was buried. I have one objection over here. I added a word there. It says, the rich man died and was buried. It doesn't say that his body was buried and his soul flew off. It says that the rich man was died and was buried buried. Let's read the note. The text is explicit. The rich man not only died, but was also buried. Now, the Bible says that when a person dies, their body returns to the dust. This being the case, what is the rich man doing in hell with all of his body parts? <laughs> Are you with me? The story tells us that he had eyes and tongue. On the other hand, Lazarus is said to have fingers <laughs> after he goes to the bosom of Abraham. Supposedly it was his soul that went to the bosom of Abraham. And yet it says here that he has fingers. So if the body goes to the grave when a person dies, the body parts go to the grave. So if this is happening at death, what is... Uh, the, this um, rich man doing with all of his body parts and Lazarus with his body parts if they went to the grave. The fact is this shows that this is an allegory. This is not speaking literally. In Mark 9, 43 to 48, we are told that the sinner's whole body will be cast into hell. So it's not only the soul that goes to suffer in hell. Jesus said that the whole body is thrown into hell, which means that it can't happen at death. Because at death, you know, you can exhume a body and the body's still there, right? So obviously, the body is thrown into hell at the very end of time. Now, the fact is that if both the rich man and Lazarus have body parts, and if the body is not cast into hell until the end of the age, then this must be describing what will happen at the end of the age and not what took place at the moment of death. Now here's an interesting tidbit. Robert Morey was one of Walter Martin's watchdogs. Have you ever heard of Walter Martin? Uh, he was the one who, uh, who went to the general conference and said he wanted to learn more about Adventists. 
and uh, he was provided material by uh, Leroy Froome and others. And uh, you know, after meeting with them several times and studying uh, the materials that were given to him, uh, he came to the conclusion that Seventh-day Adventists are not a cult. Seventh-day Adventists are a full-fledged denomination. They're fully Christians. Like we need uh, the endorsement of somebody uh, other than God to say that we're truly Christians. You know, but, but anyway, Robert Morey was one of the research assistants of Walter Martin. And it's interesting to note what he had to say about this story. Even he is going to say that this story is not a literal story. And by the way, he wrote a whole book trying to prove that when a person dies, that person's soul goes to hell. But notice what he says about this particular story. The only story, by the way, that would perhaps even give an impression that people burn after death. This is what he stated. Everyone understood that these parables and dialogues did not literally take place. It was understood that the rabbis used imaginative stories and dialogues as a teaching method. It was understood by all that these dialogues never took place. Ah, interesting. Praise the Lord for our enemies. <laughs> Jesus was merely using the dialogue method to get across the concept that there is no escape from torment, no second chance, and we must believe the scriptures in this life unto salvation. Very interesting admission that he makes. So the only passage in the Bible which appears to teach eternal torment at the moment of death is, according to Robert Morey, admittedly an event that, which never took place. It's a, it's, a, it's a parable, it's an allegory. It's not necessarily true to life. Number four, according to the Bible, where will the angels take the faithful when Jesus comes? Because according to Josephus, the angels, when a person dies, takes the soul to the bosom of Abraham or leads the souls of the wicked into the burning section of Hades. What does the Bible teach? When are the angels going to take the righteous people to the bosom, not of Abraham, but of Jesus? Well, it says in uh, Matthew 24, verse 31, speaking about the second coming, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. And then where are the angels going to take the elect after they gather them up? The Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the righteous will be caught up, the righteous dead will resurrect, they will be caught up with the righteous living to meet Jesus in the clouds, in the air. And then Jesus will not take them to the bosom of Abraham, he will take them to his father's house. Amen. All kinds of problems when you try to uh, impose on this uh, passage what the passage is not actually teaching. In the parable, Lazarus was taken to the bosom of Abraham by the angels, but the Bible tells us that the righteous will be caught up by the angels to Jesus. Number five. According to the parable, was the rich man able to communicate with Abraham after he died? Yes. Right? They're talking one to another. So what would this entail if, uh, if the rich man and Lazarus are entertaining a conversation? What would you have to believe? You would have to believe that the, that the dead can communicate with the with the dead, right? Is that biblical? No. Let's notice this. And he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. So there's a communication supposedly between the rich man and Abraham. Have mercy on me. But Abraham replied to the rich man, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. So is there a conversation going on here between the rich man and Abraham? Absolutely. Would this mean that there can be communication uh, from dead people? 
That's the impression it would leave, right? What did God say about people who claim to be able to talk with dead people? Let's read Deuteronomy 18, 10 and 11. It's in your note there. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. It says there, there shall, be found, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. So let me ask you, would Abraham be, be disobeying the Lord if his soul was speaking to the rich man? Absolutely. Would Abraham be disobeying the command that God had given? Absolutely not. Clearly, all of these reasons show that this story is not a true-to-life story. It was told with the specific purpose of teaching a central truth, which we're going to notice in a few moments. Number six. What does the Bible explicitly teach about the dead? This is a text that every evangelist uses when he speaks about the state of the dead. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. How much do the dead know? Nothing. Nothing. So if the dead don't know anything, how is it that Abraham is talking to the rich man and the rich man is talking to Abraham? It doesn't, doesn't square, it doesn't fit. Now, what is meant by the expression bosom of Abraham? It says now, this is speaking about John the Apostle, who is at the right side of Jesus, and he's leaning on the bosom of Jesus. What does that mean, leaning on the bosom of Jesus? It says there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, and now comes the key, whom Jesus what? Yeah. Whom Jesus loved. The bosom in the Bible, as well as today, refers to a position of particular closeness to someone. And you have other references there. Uh, in parentheses, I'm not going to mention them all, but all of these texts that you have in parentheses speak about the bosom representing closeness to someone. We will later see that the Jewish nation claimed to be particularly close to whom? To Abraham. Yet Jesus said that spiritually there was an impassable gulf between Abraham and them. That's uh, the great gulf fixed. Incidentally, if the parable is to be taken literally, then the bosom of Abraham must also be literal. How large must that bosom be? <laughs> so you can't pick and choose and say, this is literal, this is symbolic. No, if it's a symbolic story, it's, everything is symbolic. If it's a literal story, well, then it's literal. So summarizing, can the parable be taken literally? No. No. For all these reasons. Number one, people go where when they die? To the grave. When is hell? At death? No. When Jesus comes. Number three, uh, we are told that the, the rich man died and he was buried. And he has all of his body parts there. So this cannot be at death. This has to be at the end of the age. Furthermore, the angels don't take the faithful to the bosom of Abraham. They take the faithful to the bosom of Jesus. Amen. Not upon death, but, upon, but at the second coming. Furthermore, there's communication between uh, two dead people, which the Bible strictly forbids. Furthermore, the Bible says that the dead know nothing. And finally, we find that the bosom of Abraham cannot be taken literally because he would have to have a huge bosom. <laughs> so clearly, uh, for these reasons, this is not a literal story. And Robert Morey admitted that it can't be a literal story, of course. 
When you read it carefully, it's, it's absolutely clear that you cannot take the story literally. Number eight, what indication do we have that Jesus was using satire and irony in this parable? Well, notice what the rich man is crying out. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Wow! How much good would it do for Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool the tongue of the rich man? <laughs> if this were literal, the water would evaporate before it got to the rich man's tongue. <laughs> Obviously, Jesus is speaking with irony. Notice also that the rich man trusted Abraham to receive mercy instead of the Lord. Ah, in the Gospels, did the Jews trust Abraham more than they trusted the Lord? Yes. So we begin to catch the picture of who the rich man represents and who Lazarus represents. They are symbolic. See, people try to use this passage to prove that hell, people go to hell when they die and they burn eternally there, and they totally miss what Jesus was trying to teach in the parable. So let's notice the first application of the parable. The parable has more than one application. In fact, it has three applications. Let's notice the first one. It applies to the literal Jewish nation. What is the central theme of this parable? Christ's Object Lessons 260, Ellen White answers this question. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Christ shows that in this life that is now, Men decide their eternal destiny. During probationary time, no after probation will be granted them. As it says in Hebrews chapter 9, it is it appointed for men to die once, and after that the judgment. So, you know, we speak about the close of probation at the end of time. And we say, you know, we need to be all ready for the close of probation. True enough, if we're alive during that period. But if we should die today, our probation is closed. So there's an individual closing of the door of probation. And there's also a corporate close of the door of probation. And by the way, for some people, probation closes while they're alive. Awesome thought. Mm -hmm. Ellen White says that when Judas left the upper room, to betray Christ, Satan possessed him. And th there was no return. The door closed for him. Then, of course, later he goes and he commits suicide. Number two, what contrast is drawn in this parable? Well, we're talking now literally about the application to the rich and the poor. This parable draws a contrast between the what? The rich who have not made God their dependence, notice that it's not all rich people. Is it a sin to be rich? No, then uh, Abraham was the greatest sinner because he was very rich. David was very rich. Job was very rich. Ellen White makes it clear, who have not made God their dependence. And the poor, who have made God their dependence. So, uh, you'll notice here that uh, there's nothing partic particularly uh, virtuous in being poor, and there's nothing particularly wrong with being rich. It's only when you depend on riches that riches become a curse. Number three, the story does not say that the rich man mistreated Lazarus. What then was the sin of the rich man? Notice the answer. But he, that is the rich man, was selfishly indifferent to the needs of his suffering brother. This is the sin of neglect. It's the sin of omission. It's not doing what we are supposed to do. Number four. What is the essence of all idolatry? All covetousness is condemned as idolatry. 
If this definition was applied to idolatry today, how many idolaters would there be in the church? And by the way, you don't have to worship an idol of silver or gold. All you have to do is worship Wall Street. The money that you invest for selfish purposes. So anything that takes the place of God, that we place before God, is an idol. Which, uh, which is a solemn thought. Because we usually think of idolatry as having an idol and bowing before the idols, like the, like the Hindus. But idolatry, Ellen White describes here as covetousness. And the Apostle Paul also, in Colossians 3 verse 5, says that uh, idolatry is covetousness. Number five, why did Jesus use this theologically erroneous parable? Was the, the parable theologically incorrect? Of course it was. Because the souls of righteous people don't go to the bosom of Abraham and the souls of wicked people don't go uh, to burn in the fires of Hades. That's a simple fact. So why did Jesus use a story that was theologically incorrect? Well, Ella White gives us the answer. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. He was using their frame of reference, especially the Pharisees' frame of reference. The doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. And we notice in the context, the biblical context, that the Pharisees are the ones that are mentioned specifically. The Savior knew their ideas, and He framed His parable so as to inculcate important truths through these preconceived opinions. So He uses this story clearly indicating that it was a parable, that it was not true to life because the Jews were acquainted with Flavius Josephus. So Jesus says, I'm going to take this uh, with the concept of Flavius Josephus, because he was born later. But uh, Josephus is simply reflecting the idea that the Jews had before. And so, so uh, you know, Jesus knew what their frame of reference was, what Josephus taught about this. And so he said, I'm going to take their story, I'm going to use it, I'm going to give it a twist, and I'm going to actually say that the one that they're expecting to be in the bosom of Abraham is going to be in the fires, whereas those that they expect to be in the fires are going to be in the bosom of Abraham. Are you understanding what, this, what is taking place here? Now, what did Jesus mean by the expression, a great gulf fixed? Once again, Christ's Object Lessons, page 263. Thus Christ represented the hopelessness of looking for a second probation. This life is the only time given to man in which to prepare for eternity. When you die, your destiny is fixed. There's a great gulf fixed between the wicked and the righteous. That is the central truth. Number seven, whom did the rich man place above God? Ah, Ellen White explains, he did not pray to God, but to Abraham. Interesting. In whom was his hope centered? In Abraham, Father Abraham. Thus he showed that he placed Abraham above God, and that he relied on his relationship to Abraham for salvation. Is that true in all of the Gospels of the Jews of Christ's day? Ah, oh, Abraham is our father. Abraham. Uh, John the Baptist says, and don't think to say that we are children of Abraham. God can raise children of Abraham from these stones. Number nine. Number eight. How do our privileges relate to our responsibilities? We've discussed this in a lesson yesterday. Man's responsibilities are proportionate to his opportunities and privileges. So does God expect more where more is given? Absolutely. Number nine, how can we lay up treasures beside the throne of God? Ellen White responds, Christ's Object Lessons 266, 
far better might he lay up his money beside the throne of God by using it to do good. Death cannot make any man poor who this devotes himself, thus devotes himself to seeking eternal riches. But the man who hoards his treasure for self cannot take, it, take any of it to heaven. Have you noticed the number of times that Jesus spoke about money? Amen. You have all these references here in the footnote. Jesus knew that money was a big issue. That money could be the stumbling block for, for many, many people to be lost. And he told all kinds of parables and stories about money because he knew that covetousness is the root of all sin. By the way, that's the reason why covetousness is, is condemned in the 10th commandment. Because, because covetousness is at the root of all of the sins in the Ten Commandments, when you really look at it carefully. And by the way, it's interesting that the Tenth Commandment forbids covetousness, and the tithe is 10%. Are there many thieves in the church? There are thieves in the church. You know, they say, I don't have enough money to tithe. And what I tell them is, I have, a, I have a formula where you'll always have enough to tithe. Tithe first. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, but then I won't have enough to pay my bills. So it's more important to pay Caesar than God. God is number one. Amen. So you can read all of these statements here uh, in the note. All of these uh, references deal with money, what Jesus had to say about money. Uh, there's this Ellen White quotation at the end of this list. She wrote, money cannot be carried into the next life. It is not needed there. <laughs> but the good deeds done in winning souls to Christ are carried to the heavenly courts. So where should we be investing our money? In winning souls. Because when we invest our money in winning souls, the souls will be in heaven. So the investment produced dividends, eternal dividends. Now let's notice the second application of the parable. I had mentioned before that the first application applies to the Jews. It applies to individuals. Now we're going to notice the application to the Jewish nation. Whom does the rich man represent? The rich man was favored with every temporal and spiritual blessing, but he refused to cooperate with God in the use of these blessings. Thus it was with what? with the Jewish nation. So whom does the rich man represent in the second application? He represents the Jewish nation. And the note gives us the reasons why. In the strictest sense of the word, the rich man represents the Pharisees. This is true for at least five reasons. Number one, the rich man addressed Abraham as father, and Abraham addressed Lazarus as son. Does that tell us something? Yeah. Absolutely. Who were the ones that, can, that can constantly were saying, we are children of Abraham? The Pharisees. Number two, the Pharisees claimed to have a special closeness to Abraham. Jesus would never have described the Gentiles as being in the bosom of Abraham. So not only do you have uh, Abraham calling uh, you know, Lazarus, uh, calling the rich man's son, and the rich man calling Abraham father, but also it says here that it speaks about the bosom of Abraham. Who claimed to be close to Abraham? The Pharisees and the Jews in general. Number three, the rich man had five brothers. These could very well represent the other Jewish denominations of Christ's day. The Sadducees, the Herodians, the scribes, the Zealots, and the Essenes. These were all Jewish denominations of the days of Christ. Number four, it is clear that the rich man believed in the immortality of the soul because he asked Abraham to send someone to his brother, to his brother from among the dead. This is precisely what the Pharisees believed. We've already noticed that the Pharisees believed in the immortality of the soul. And finally, the brothers of the rich man had Moses and the prophets. Who were the ones that claimed to have Moses and the prophets? The Jews, and particularly in a special sense, the Pharisees. So for all of these reasons, we know that, the, that this rich man represents 
the Pharisees specifically and the Jewish nation in general. Now what did Jesus teach regarding natural genetic lineage? Ellen White wrote, Christ recognized no virtue in lineage. He taught that spiritual connection supersedes all natural connection. And you know, if you'll notice what John chapter 8 says, uh, the, the Jews say to Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if Abraham was your father, you would love me because Abraham saw my day and he loved me. How is it that you hate me and you say that you're Abraham's children when Abraham loved me? And then Jesus goes on to say, you're not Abraham's children. You are of your father the devil because the devil is the one that wants, my, that wants me to die. So, so Jesus is teaching that, that just Jewish lineage, descendants from Abraham, has no significance. It's a spiritual relationship with Abraham. In other words, doing the works of Abraham and having the spirit of Abraham. Number three, what did Jesus say to a Gentile woman who begged Jesus to heal her daughter, and what did the woman say in return? Well, Jesus appeared to be quite drastic here. He said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. It appears that Jesus is calling her a dog. By the way, did you notice in the parable of the rich man Lazarus that, uh, you know, the, the Lazarus was at the foot of the table and uh, crumbs fell from the table and the dogs came and licked his sores? <laughs> Here's the connection. The woman says, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Was she a true, true child of Abraham? She was. The note, there are several parallel words in this passage to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Crumbs, dogs, table, children. This would indicate that Lazarus represents the Gentiles. The Jews referred to the Gentiles as stones, because supposedly they had stony hearts, as dogs, and as swine. Oh, wow. Talk about being mean-spirited. Number four, thought question. Sometimes it is important not only to read what a passage says, but also what it does not say. Because evangelicals put words into this parable. Does this passage use any of the following words? Immediately after he died, his body was buried, his soul was in everlasting torments. Send the soul to Lazarus, being in the everlasting torments of Hades, in this eternal flame, his soul is comforted. None of those, none of those words that are in bold appear there, and yet evangelicals inject them into the, into the verse, into the verses. Number five, what indication do we have in the parable that the rich man believed in the immortality of the soul? Now we come to a crucial point, folks. These next two questions are critically important to understand this parable because we're going to see that even though the Pharisees to whom Jesus directed this teaching believed in the immortality of the soul, Jesus believed in the resurrection of the dead. Notice number five, what indication do we have in the parable that the rich man believed in the immortality of the soul? Because he speaks to Abraham, he says, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Let me ask you, did the rich man believe that the dead could go and speak from the dead? Notice that it doesn't say, if someone go, resurrects and goes to them. It says, if someone went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Jesus is reflecting the views of the Pharisees. But now notice the concept of Jesus. This is a very important nuance that has been often missed in this parable. Did Jesus believe a dead person could impart a message to the rich man's five brothers? Notice. And Jesus said unto him, that is unto the rich man. Actually, it's not Jesus who says it. It's Abraham who says it to the rich man. If they hear not Moses... And the prophets, neither will they pers be persuaded, though one 
rise from the dead. Are you catching the difference? The rich man is saying, send one from among the dead. And Abraham says, listen, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe someone even though he rises from the dead. And uh, you'll notice in the note here, it is clear that Jesus believed in the resurrection of the dead, not in the immortality of the soul. The word rise in this text is used repeatedly by Luke to describe the resurrection. It is also used by Jesus in John 11, 24 and 25, the resurrection of Lazarus, to describe his own resurrection. So very clearly, the, the rich man believes in the immortality of the soul. He says, send someone from among the dead. Jesus says, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe if someone rises from the dead or resurrects from the dead. Number seven. Why did Jesus employ the proper name Lazarus? Now, remember that this is the only parable where a proper name is used. So the question is, why did Jesus put a proper name in a parable if parables did not use proper names? There's a sp specific historical reason. The answer to this question is found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 265, paragraph 1. When Jesus resurrected Lazarus, they refused to believe. Did Jesus resurrect a man called Lazarus after, this, after Jesus told this parable? Absolutely. Did they believe in Jesus when he resurrected Lazarus? No, they didn't. What did they attempt to do? They wanted to kill him. The next question, what did the Jews attempt to do to Jesus after he resurrected Lazarus? It says, from, thence, from, from then, thenceforth, they took counsel together to put him to death. What did they try to do to Lazarus? This is the next question. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. So a man resurrected from the dead. Notice that Jesus believed in the resurrection. A man named Lazarus resurrects from the dead. And they don't believe. Do you understand now why Jesus used the proper name Lazarus? He wanted to connect it to another historical event. And it was necessary to do so in order that they would understand. So was it proved true that if they didn't believe Moses and the prophets, they would not believe if one rose from the dead? It was historically proven. Now, number nine, the note. The words of Jesus in this parable of the rich man and Lazarus were proved literally true. Lazarus went to the Jews after rising from the dead, and yet they did not believe in Jesus. This is what Jesus meant when he said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So was Jesus changing their view that Lazarus could actually speak with Abraham? And he was saying that in order to speak, Lazarus would have to what? He would have to resurrect. So did Jesus believe in the immortality of the soul? No, he believed in the resurrection of the dead. Now, here's, the, here's the, another important point. Was the Jewish nation consumed by fire for the rejection of the Messiah? Did this story literally take place because they believed not Moses and the prophets? They did not believe even Lazarus in Jesus because he resurrected Lazarus from the dead? Absolutely. It says, the king, and we studied this parable yesterday, the king sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers, and what did he do? He burned up their city. So did the end consequence of this parable take place in the year 70 AD? Yes, it did. The city of Jerusalem was burned up by the Romans, and the Jews have been suffering fiery trials ever since. The kingdom was taken from the Jewish theocracy and was given to the Gentiles. So what is the central truth of this parable? Is it trying to teach us what happens when a person dies? Is that the central thought of the, of the parable? What happens when someone dies? No. What it's trying to teach is in this life, we make decisions that determine our eternal reward. And that you cannot claim special privileges 
because of your lineage, because of your, uh, all of your different characteristics, your intelligence, etc. No, none of that matters when it comes to the eternal reward. And of course, the illustration, Jesus in the first application, is dealing with the relationship between the literally rich, who use their riches for themselves, and the poor. And in the second application, he's speaking about the Jewish nation that considered themselves rich because they were children of Abraham, but they were really poor because they rejected Christ. Whereas the Gentiles, who were poor, so to speak, they're rich because they embrace and receive Jesus Christ. These are the central truths of the parable. It's not trying to teach what happens that a person goes to hell to burn when they die. Because we've already noticed that people don't go to hell when they die. They're burned in the fire when Jesus comes. Very clearly. Okay, let's go to the final application of the parable. This is the, at the very end time. To whom does the parable apply in the end time? Ellen White responds, Today, there is a class in our world who are self-righteous. They are not gluttons. They are not drunkards. They are not infidels, but they desire to live for themselves, not for God. He is not in their thoughts. Therefore, they are classified with unbelievers. Wow, that's an amazing thought. What is it that fits us to dwell with Christ in heaven? Very important. To learn of Christ means to receive His grace, which is His character. But those who do not appreciate and utilize the precious opportunities and sacred influences granted them on earth are not fitted to take part in the pure devotion of heaven. So the contrast is between what we do in this life determines what happens with us in the next life. Amen. Thought question. Do you suppose that this parable could have something to do with the message of Jesus to the Laodicean church? You think? Well, what does Laodicea say? Hmm. I am rich and increased with goods and I have need of nothing. Would that fit in with the central theme of this parable? Absolutely. But Jesus looks at Laodicea differently. See, Laodicea says, I'm rich, but God says, you're not rich. You are poverty stricken. Whereas those who are hot and not Laodicean, even though they're poor, they're rich. Let's notice Revelation chapter 3. This is the end time application. This is the application to the end time church, our church. Verse 15, I know your works. Jesus is speaking here. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold, or cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, what is, what is lukewarm water? It's a combination of hot and cold, right? If you have real hot water and you, you can't drink it because it's so hot, you pour in cold water, and the result is lukewarm. So what does Laodicea have hot? Her profession. What does she have cold? Her practice. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor co cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's the shaking, folks. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Is that what the rich man said in the parable? Yes. And you do not know it's called willful ignorance. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable. What's the next word? Poor, poor blind, and naked. Quite an assessment of the end time church. And we need to take it to heart. 
because the church is not in Washington DC, the church is us. Each of us is, is, is a member of the church. So this is speaking not only to the leadership in Washington DC and over on Willow, speaking to us. And so Jesus gives counsel to his end time church. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Ellen White descri describes this as faith that works by love. It's a faith that works by love towards other people, which the rich man, the rich man did not mistreat Lazarus. He ignored him. Is it perhaps possible that we're not mistreating people, but we're ignoring them? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be what? Ah, faith that works by love, so that you can be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed, because Laodicea trusts in her own righteousness. So Jesus says, no, you need my robe, not your righteousness. So it says, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. So Laodicea is blind. By the way, do you know what the eyes of the church are? The gift of prophecy. That's, why the, that's the reason why prophets were originally called seers. So does the Seventh-day Adventist church have eyes? What are the eyes of the Seventh-day Adventist church? The spirit of prophecy. Is it just possible that Laodicea is blind because Laodicea has ignored and rejected the gift of prophecy? So it says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Why does God speak so powerfully, so, so strongly here, so politically incorrect? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and what? Be zealous and repent. So these stories have a definite application to our own personal experience. Over and above, speaking about rich and poor, literally, speaking about the Jews and the Gentiles, speaking about the end time generation, it speaks to us personally that our priorities need to be to use all of the resources that God has given us to bless humanity. That we cannot neglect the sin of omission. When we study about the sheep and the goats, we're going to see that there's a sin of commission and there's a sin of omission. May the Lord help us not to commit either kind of sin of commission or of omission.